Welcome to session three. So this is a session on uh, foundational learning and instructional coherence. We're going to have four high quality papers. We have three presenters here in person. And then Jen is online. She's in uh, Ghana. Jen, I hope you're there. So a brief summary. These are four high quality papers. Two are on targeted instruction. One, a rich ethnography contrast, contrasting learner experiences across two subsequent grades. And the last one is system level instructional coherence analysis. We'll start with Mitchell, and then he'll be followed by Jen, who'll be presenting online, and then Miriam and Deji. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mitchell to come and start off. Forward, backwards, pointing. No worries, stay there. Sounds great, thank you all. Really looking forward to sharing this paper with you. Really proud of this work and the work that went into the evaluation because it personally got me, got me thinking about how to structure these kind of foundational learning programs in this context, but also just how to deal with implementation challenges. So I'm looking forward to sharing that as well with you all. So without further ado, this is a joint work with my colleagues at ID Insights, Michael Sabele, Jeff McManus, and Tissé Mwanza Leia Mwai Gasol Pignon. I'm Micho, I'm a junior economist based in ID Insights Senegal office. So before we dive in, here's an outline of my presentation. I'll start by giving some background. I'll then move on to the evaluation design. After this, we'll dive into the results and then some key takeaways, including remarks. So Liberia is a country that is witnessing relative socioeconomic stability, but continues to be a challenging context with these challenges amplified by the Ebola outbreak and the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking at literacy outcomes, we see that in Liberia, literacy rates are quite low. According to the World Bank, the adult male literacy rate sits at 63%. The adult female literacy rate sits at 34%. And the average across both sexes is about less than half, which sits below the regional average of, sorry, two thirds and less than the world average of four out of five adults. And a literacy assessment conducted in Liberian public schools found that grade two students could read about 10 correct words per minute, much lower than the Ministry of Education benchmark of 35 correct words per minute. Also, these crises have led to a large overage population in schools. Um, in early childhood education classrooms, we see that 67% of ECE children were over the age expected for their grade, and they're expected to be between the ages three to five. And then also looking at the uh, population of children that are of the official age that are actually enrolled in school, we find that the net enrollment rate is about 58%. So what's being done? One policy that's been implemented is the Liberia Education Advancement Plan, mm -hmm. Advancement Program. This is a multi-partner public-private partnership um, where private partners support the management of Liberia government schools. The Rising Academy Network is one of the private partners that supports the management of LEAVE schools. RAND supports 95 government schools as part of this program, and they developed the FASTA Reading Program in 2021 and asked us to come in to help them design an RCT to evaluate it. So the FASTA Reading Program is a 20-week phonics-based accelerated reading program inspired by teaching at the right level. <clears throat> Excuse me. The program was designed as a catch-up program for students in RAND-supported schools who hadn't developed foundational reading skills. The FAST reading program has multiple components. The first is a teacher training session that lasted for about three days. Then there were regular target assessments. So once you're assigned to your baseline reading level, then they reassess you at the end of each cycle. So the program, 20 weeks long, was split into five four-week cycles. They are reassessed at each cycle. Then they had classroom monitoring that was done by RAN hired and trained school performance managers. They also distributed teacher guides and student workbooks and a mobile app to help teachers with their understanding of how to deliver a phonics-based curriculum. So now, jumping into the evaluation design. So which students do we focus on? We focused on overage ECE children. And we do this for three main reasons. First, it's a policy priority for RAN and the Ministry of Education. And also because only ECE classrooms were included in the randomization. 
all schools control and treatment were instructed to give the program to grades three to six. Treatment schools were instructed to include ECE classrooms. As maybe some of you are already thinking, this likely led to some confusion, um, which we talk about a little later, around what is your treatment assignment? And that led to quite a bit of non-compliance, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Please note that primary grades that didn't receive the program or grades one and two, where kids are expected to be between the ages of six to seven, and that's because the faster reading curriculum overlapped with their core curriculum. And lastly, resource constraints meant we couldn't survey all ECE children. What we hope to learn, we wanted to know what's the impact of the program on reading level, reading proficiency, what's the impact on non-reading outcomes, such as numeracy, attendance, and retention, and then also do treatment effects vary by gender or baseline reading level. We also wanted to see what challenges and opportunities were observed during program implementation. This is an infographic of our sampling strategy. There are quite a few steps, and just for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but just to highlight that we applied an eligibility criteria to RAND's 95 schools, where a school had to have an ECE section, naturally, and had to have enough teachers to support the implementation of the program. So that's more than three teachers. We stratified the randomization based on some school-level characteristics, and that leaves us with 37 treatment schools, 37 control schools. You can see that after COVID-19 school closures, one school dropped out. We do see some differential attrition, but we found that baseline characteristics are still pretty balanced across treatment and control. So most of our results are reported using this 2,303 sample um, with a return rate of about 85%. We do test, uh, we do use inverse probability weights and lead bounds on treatment effects in our robustness checks. We find that these do not meaningfully change our results, but those are available in the paper. To give a sense of the geographic spread, of the schools. This is a map showing treatment and control schools. The blue dots are control, the maroon dots are treatment. So we covered about 10 counties in our sample. So this is our reading assessment that was used to place kids into their baseline reading level, but also to test their reading proficiency at baseline and endline. Different assessments were used to assign them to their, base, uh, to their baseline reading level. And then we also have some other data that we had as supporting. So we, at N-Line, we added a numeracy assessment just to see if the fast reading program was crowding out uh, numeracy skills. We also asked students to report their perceptions of reading, their perception of school, and their reading practices at home. We also have process evaluation data that was collected by the Rising Academy Network that gave us some qualitative insights that helped us frame the quantitative results. We also have attendance data from school performance managers and school leader checks of attendance throughout the program. This is our analytical model. We use ANCOVA and we control for a vector of student level characteristics, baseline age, gender, baseline reading score, and then also a vector of categorical factors corresponding to the stratum that the student is in, so the school level strata. And then um, we test this on several outcomes of interest. So now to talk about non-compliance. So as I mentioned earlier, the program was implemented to, so in all schools in grades three to six. And some schools got confused regarding their uh, treatment assignment. And so in this table, you can see we report the number of faster reading cycles implemented across treatment and control schools. As you can see, not all treatment schools implemented all five cycles, and some control schools implemented cycles of the program. Our preferred way to deal with this in our TOT estimates is using a treatment intensity estimator. So this, we measure treatment as the percent of cycles that were implemented. So if you implemented three cycles, that'd be 60%. And so uh, this does rely on a couple of assumptions that I talk about in detail in the paper. We can talk about during the Q&A, but just for the sake of time, I'll jump over to the results. And we mostly report this for our TOT estimates, this treatment intensity estimator. So now jumping into the results, I'll start with the measures of reading proficiency. And in this chart, the y-axis is the change in faster reading levels between baseline and endline. So I report two bars. The left bar is the control group average. Then there's a the treatment group average with treatment effects measured using our treatment intensity estimator for non-compliance. And also we put the ITT estimates in parentheses just for reference. So we see that um, ITT estimates for the program are modest, but and statistically insignificant. We see a 0.07 increase in reading levels between baseline and endline for treatment school students. Once we account for non-compliance, this difference grows to 0.12 reading levels, which translates to about 0.28 standard deviations. 
you don't see any statistically significant differences between subgroups. And we also don't see a statistically significant effect on numeracy outcomes. It's not reported here, but it's in the paper as well. So we, this tells us that the FASTA reading program didn't crowd out um, math instruction. And we found that treatment school uh, children were more likely to be present. Our ITT estimates puts it at 0.08% more likely. When our ITT, uh, treatment intensity estimate, when we account for non-compliance, puts us at about 11.4% more likely to be present during the school performance manager's attendance checks. Now looking at non-reading outcomes, here as well, we don't really see many effects. However, interestingly, we find that students assigned to the treatment group were 7% less likely to practice reading at home. Once we account for non-compliance, that difference grows to about 12%. So treatment school children said they were less likely to practice reading at home. So now just what, what does this tell us? How do we interpret these results? So what do we do with this information? So overall, our results show that the program likely improved reading proficiency for overage EC students by about 0.28 standard deviation, even with implementation challenges. We also think that it's likely cost effective. We did a cost effectiveness analysis using our um, treatment intensity estimates. Of course, this comes with some caveats that are covered in more detail in uh, the paper, but our estimates show that the program has a cost effectiveness of 0.91 standard deviation learning gains for $100. And this is similar to j -PAL's estimates for three other foundational literacy programs, such as one on computer-assisted learning in India, a remedial education program in India, and a contract teacher's innovation in Kenya that all have a cost effectiveness estimate of about one standard deviation for $100. And then what are the learnings for other foundational literacy programs? So apart from the typical challenges of a new program, such as piloting a new curriculum, training teachers, getting materials to schools, we observed two main challenges in the implementation of the program. So first, phonics-based reading instruction is very different from how reading is traditionally taught in government schools in Liberia. The standard curriculum uses a whole language approach coupled with memorization, repetitive call and response, and many RAND teachers didn't feel prepared to deliver a radically different approach to reading. In the process evaluation data, we found that 36% of teachers said I at least sometimes didn't feel prepared to deliver the program. And the fact that fewer than half of the schools in the treatment group implemented all five cycles likely tells us they maybe didn't have the capacity to implement the program. So this tells us that to effectively deliver phonics instruction in schools where the whole language approach is standard probably requires more initial training, more frequent retraining, and ongoing coaching of the teachers. So I'm really glad this comes after the teacher training session that we just talked about. Also, learning in school may have spillover effects for learning at home. As mentioned earlier, the program was implemented during the school day so that teachers could feel like it was part of their day-to-day -day teaching activities. However, students exposed to the full program said that we're 12% less likely to report reading at home. And that might be because they have to focus on other things at home, such as their math homework. And the fact that we don't see an effect on math scores maybe tells us that this is an efficient trade-off. You do a little bit, there are moderate effects on reading and there no, there's no knock-on effect to math. But maybe they're not practicing reading at home because they don't have materials that correspond to the new curriculum. Or parents don't know how to teach them or how to support them um, in this new curriculum. So those are some of the things that we think program designers should carefully consider these externalities to the program. So even with the challenges encountered and the fact that the program is in its infancy and will likely go through many iterations, we believe these findings show promise and provide valuable learnings for any program looking to scale phonics-based instruction or teaching at the right level um, in this context. So I think I'm good for time. That is it. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jennifer Parakumi. I am a doctoral researcher at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I'm really sad that I'm not in person. In fact, I can't actually even see the audience. I just see the podium. So um, if you are making quizzical faces at me, I won't be able to see them. Um, but I am, oh, there we go. I see waves. Thank you for that. I. I love an interactive presentation. So this makes me the saddest to be sitting at a desk and not being physically present. So thank you for those who waved at me. 
Um, I am presenting some work from my doctoral research, a chapter um, on empirical evidence from Botswana, foundational learning and mental health. Um, this research was done um, thanks to support from the Rise Gap Filling um, uh, fund and also CSAE and done in collaboration with the Botswana Ministry of Basic Education. Uh, so what you'll see here, feel free to interrogate it. I hope it'll generate a really great discussion. Um, okay, sorry, next slide. So I, this is the outline of our presentation. I'll give you some background and context for the Botswana case study, the research questions, um, how I measured my outcomes of interest, a little bit of my design, key findings and main takeaways. So just to give you a little bit of a background and motivation for my study, Globally, what we know is that 20% of children and adolescents suffer from some type of mental um, health disorder, some mental disorder. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, one in seven children and adolescents suffer from significant um, mental health difficulties. Additionally, we also know that early onset mental health problems have potential to affect long-term development and, and well-being. And 90% of our young people, the global population of young people are in low and middle income countries. So I think this presents a really serious education and general um, global health policy, education policy challenge. So what we also know that there's a growing literature that links children's um, emotional and behavioral health to their education outcomes. So such as test scores and attendance, and that of course schools can provide an the enabling environment that can be leveraged to support uh, mental health and well-being. So a number of research has been done in, in the school setting that also has knock-on effects on um, children's well-being outcomes. And as I believe would believe intuitively as well, that a positive school climate can lead to improved mental health and education success outcomes. And some of the mechanisms that have been observed here is that you know positive relationships between teachers and students are linked to decreases in mental health problems. So so this sets the scene for um, why I'm interested in investigating an ongoing uh, pedagogical approach that has been spoken about, I'm sure at length even mentioned in the previous presentation, which is teaching at the right level. Uh, so it's, it's not new to anyone in the room, I'm sure, but to level set, we know that it is a targeted numeracy and literacy intervention backed by multiple rigorous evaluations, constantly shown to improve learning in multiple contexts, as we've seen and multiple delivery models. So of course there's a variance depending on who's delivering it, but uh, most often there is uh, an increase in learning outcomes. So the innovation here of course is that let's teach at the, the child's um, capability level rather than the assigned grade. So in the Botswana context where I'm looking at, um, this is typically done over 30 days, nine weeks, assess group by level targeted and fund instruction. So the, and focus on standard three to five. So I will speak a little bit more about the sample that I worked in, um, but just, just to keep going, give you a little bit more about Botswana. There's Botswana in the red, if you haven't been, please go, it's a fantastic country. Um, Basic education is the first 10 years in Botswana. The net enrollment, um, according to the, the most recent statistics that we have is about 93%. So most of, so although there is an out of school population, most of the children are in school. And then a study that was done by um, University of Botswana professors, Panziri, Tayang, as well as researchers at Youth Impact um, found that, you know, one in 10 students could not do division at standard five. This was an expectation at standard three level, two to three, um, and 20% couldn't read a paragraph. And then linking back to, to health, as I'm going to be speaking about mental health, uh, studies in Botswana have also found insufficient mental health data to inform any kind of policy around young people and adolescents. So bringing all of these things together, I ask a couple of research questions. I want to understand what is the impact of foundational learning, teaching at the right level, on the overall mental health and well-being of students. Secondly, I want to understand what is the impact of foundational learning on the anxiety, specifically on the anxiety and depressive symptoms of students. And then I want to understand what's the impact on TAL on those who are predisposed to mental health difficulties at baseline. So those who at baseline had a higher level um, above the quote unquote normal threshold, um, if they are more or less affected by the pedagogy. 
And then, of course, because it's tile, I also looked in my sample to understand what was the impact of tile on the education success of students. And by education success here, I'm defining that by um, school-based test scores and attendance of students. So I use a couple of instruments to understand um, mental health. Uh, the first tool that I use is the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. All of these tools are really well, they have really good psychometric uh, properties in the literature. So the English version of these tools have really good properties, but then I back translated them um, working with a team of people and then also tested the reliability and validity of the tools in the Botswana context. So we have the strengths and difficulties questionnaire and the some of the, the constructs that it targets include emotional symptoms, conduct problems, peer relationship problems, hyperactivity, pro-social behavior. And these are a combination of internalizing and externalizing mental health difficulties, which is why it's my measure of overall mental health. And then I look specifically at anxiety and depressive symptoms. And this is my RCADS, my revised child and anxiety scale. So this specifically looks at more internalizing mental health challenges. So typically when we talk about mental health, we are we often in our discourse think about anxiety, depression, trauma. These are more internalizing uh, mental health difficulties, but I wanted to capture both internalizing and externalizing, which is why I use the two. Um, and then I had the teachers in my sample um, report on all their students in their classes. So I use a short um, SDQ tool to just get a sense of what the teacher's observations were of, of their students. And then, of course, admin data for my school test results and my attendance. Um, so that those are my outcomes. And what I do here is I do a standard diff and diff to tease out this relationship. Okay, it looks like we've lost Jen. Sorry about that. Hopefully we get back to Jen at some point. So let's move to Miriam. Um, seven, seven and a half. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm sorry to be interrupting Jen's presentation, I feel like. Uh, but anyways, my paper is called, and it is a paper, and I've draw deeply on the anthropological tradition and feeling very much a fish out of water here. So I do want to make that distinction. This is a paper, not a presentation. And it's called the ninth, tenth dipole system. Slightly pretentious, I grant you, especially as a non-physicist, but I hope uh, you will be in greater sympathy by the end of the paper. Let me begin by situating my paper. First, by acknowledging its origins as part of a multi-country, multi-method study called uh, uh, Understanding the Secondary Education Experiences of Youth in Marginalized Communities in Colombia, India, and Malawi. And it was led by professors Chilkar, Kendall, and Lushai, and founded by the Wild Spencer Foundation. And it was as, as part of this study that I carried out, uh, I have been carrying out classroom and community-based ethnographic research in Padapur village since 2021 April. Badupur is home to a majority of scheduled caste or Adi Dravida households, once indentured agricultural labourer. Uh, these households have, in the last 30 to 40 years, increasingly shifted into a variety of daily wage work in nearby urban centres. These abundant but precarious livelihood opportunities have also drawn a growing number of migrants to Badapur in the last 15 years, predominantly from the MBC or the most backward communities, but also from tribal, tri tribal Irular and Kuruvar communities. It is these student groups that are primarily served uh, by Padapur's sole government high school, where I spent most of my time. Part of a rural educational block, the school is administered by the Adi, Dravida and Tribal Welfare Department, hence welfare school in local and policy parlance. The Padapur Welfare School is one of 3,000 plus high schools in Tamil Nadu, offering upper primary, which is 6 to 8th grades, as well as the high school grades of 9th and 10th. And if ASO reports are to be believed, uh, over the last decade, between 25 and 35 percent of eighth graders in rural Tamil Nadu were unable to read at second grade levels. Upper primary classes, as many of you might know, are no detention classes. That is, students are promoted from sixth to seventh to eighth, irrespective of performance. In contrast, however, the high school years culminate in the high stakes high, high school exams, the 10th board exams. 
which effectively determine students' educational futures. On these board exams, welfare schools have tended to underperform in terms of student pass rates in comparison to other schools in Tamil Nadu. And it is in this broad context of structural and educational marginalization, exacerbated, of course, by COVID, that I joined Padupur's newest ninth grade cohort as it started high school in July 2021. Of the 58 students in the two sections, about 60% belonged to Adi Dravidan and tribal households, and over a third was identified as BPL or below poverty line. How did this cohort, variously socially and educationally marginalized, experience high school? This paper attempts an answer drawing on over 20 months I spent with the students as they moved from 9th to 10th and sat the board exams in April this year. In the process, the paper also offers a commentary on the constraints and contradictions of the state education system that shaped students' lives. Finally, I situate my research in an anthropology of policy. Unlike evaluation studies that take policy as the given, with the unfortunate consequence of producing daily life in schools and classrooms as variously inadequate or deviant, an anthropological approach seeks to foreground as policy what teachers and students actually do in classrooms, how they interpret and cope with policies and educational systems. To the classroom then, the, the Kabardi and Kadai classrooms of the ninth grade, where free periods far outnumbered instructional classes for much of the year. My notes record endless Kabardi games for the boys. The girls argued endlessly about TV dramas and film songs and exchanged Uru Kadai, village gossip. But if I was frustrated about lost time on the heels of the lost pandemic years, students felt differently. It was a time to be jolly together after the lonely lockdown months. Plus, as one of the girls remind, reminded me, they were still in ninth grade. There was time enough to study in the 10th. The number of teacherless classrooms today, I tut tut in my September of observations, watching students noisily spill out into the corridor. There was another teacher's meeting in the headmaster's room. The following day, worried the boys might come to harm during a particularly rowdy kabaddi game, I find Mrs. N, their teacher, at the school's office computer. Office work, she grimaced. With no clerk at the school, much of the reporting tasks fell to her. She was one of the younger teachers and clearly tech savvy, therefore. The school had no computer lab assistant either, so Mrs. N was also responsible for the monthly computer-based assessment surveys. Two days each month, she sighed, before wondering if I could teach her classes instead. Indeed, by November, I was something of a mainstay in the school's daily substitution register. Teach something, anything, Mrs. L, the, the timetabler would coax while muttering bitterly. With 10 teachers and 10 classrooms, hers was an often impossible task. The local government elections were held in November, so teachers were pressed into their mandatory election duties. Saturdays were instructional days because it was a COVID-shortened academic year, but instead teachers were doing block-level election duties and trainings and registering voters in their wards. And it was only in February that instructional opportunity improved. December and January had festivals and uh, the half yearly exams. Uh, of course, even in February, teachers continue to be interrupted. School exchange visits, intramural competitions, science exhibitions, school management committee meeting preparations, treasury department submissions, I could go on, but at least the demands were less intense. A normal interrupted school day, the notes from this time, Riley observe. By March, however, with the 10th board exams drawing close, teachers' focus increasingly shifted to the 10th graders, and the 9th graders were left to their own devices again. Yes, they had in-class assignments to complete, typically copying out answers from textbooks, but for the most part, they fell back into Kabaddi and Kadai routines. No wonder then that in May, when students wrote the ninth annual exam, many students turned in answer papers that were largely blank or only attempted the one mark questions. Some had merely copied the questions out. I was sad and horrified. But teachers and students were far more sanguine. They had seen it all before, Mrs. N shrugged. The pandemic had made things worse, but Varsha Varsham ninth na iprida. 
This was the ninth grade, year after year. This was how it was. Mrs. C agreed. This was students' first year in high school. Press them too much and you might lose them entirely. Only if you let them be a little free now could you catch them properly in the tenth, she explained. You will see, Mrs. G promised. Once they are in the 10th grade, we will squeeze them nicely. We will set them to write before the board exams. Students echoed the sentiment. They reassured me as they had done so many times in the past year. Dentalapathiclamis, we'll see to it in the 10th. And indeed, by November, my notes were full of exclamations about the serious tone of the classroom. Now the 10th classroom, as this expert uh, excerpt goes, I leave you to read it. Study, 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 the teachers exhorted every class and every special class period as the 10th grade feverishly prepared for the half yearly exam in December. The half yearly was the first full portion exam and this was scheduled across the state so that the whole system was focused on the board exam right in December, the board exam being in April. But to be tested on the entire syllabus in December, six months after 10th grade classes had begun, six months after a year of Kabaddi and Kadai, if I was astounded by such ambition, teachers and students responded vigorously. Class time was practicing, problem set after sample question paper, doing one and two mark worksheets, writing tests reported to their parents every week. Class time was also often morning to night, hour long special classes at school before and after the school day and almost a third of the students also paid for extra tuitions late in the evening. Class time was full on and all the time. Tenth graders had no PE classes, no library classes, no craft classes and from February onwards Saturdays and Sundays were also spent at school doing mock exams and big questions, teachers and students both being there. So from the teacherless classrooms of the ninth grade to the non-stop 10th grade classroom, what had happened? Abish, newly earnest 10th grader Abish, thought for a moment before saying, when I was in ninth grade, the teachers didn't come to class. We didn't study, they didn't teach us. The teachers were strict now, his classmate Emma noted. There was none of the storytelling of the ninth grade. We were a junior class then. That's why they didn't care about us. They were taking care of the 10th students instead. But now we are going to write the board exam. So every teacher comes to class and even takes special classes. In fact, teachers were actually fighting with each other over taking classes. If anyone dared interrupt them for official work, she just pointed to the board on the, the, the blackboard saying, there's the board exam, go away. Such was the power of the 10th board exam to the exclusion of competing priorities. In order to squeeze as much class time as possible into every extended school day. A stark contrast to the ninth grade, where classroom instruction was all too readily crowded out by teachers' non-instructional responsibilities. There was nothing incidental about such contrast, however. In fact, they enabled and reinforced each other. Ashrija, one of the ninth grade toppers, astu astutely noted, last year, teachers fully concentrated on the previous batch of 10th graders, so they would have a good result, so they had to neglect us. She wasn't complaining in the least. It was the familiar cycle of schooling after all. This year, she continued, no one cares about the ninth grade, all the teachers are fully focused on us. Indeed, what sustained this peculiar cycle of neglect and focus was the sheer contrast. It was precisely by being the anti-10th grade that the ninth grade produced the 10th grade classroom as an exceptionalist, almost magical space. In the process, enabling a dramatic, almost superhuman concentration of teacher time and student effort. That is, the 10th grade transformation both required and justified the teacher deprived and learning poor ninth grade classroom. A ninth, 10th dipole system, if you will, that essentially constituted high school in Badapur. 
that this ninth, tenth dipole reproduces itself year on year, reflects its relative success, as the recently released board exam results reveal. But the poor school achieved a remarkable pass percentage of 82%. A final ethnographic vignette. April 2023, week of the 10th board exams, I'm chatting with Nishit and Viran about the upcoming English paper. I'll pass, miss, don't worry, just don't ask me to read, Nishit said. Viran noted his agreement. He didn't understand English yet, but he would score 40 marks on the exam, no doubt. And so it came to pass. The boys were not able to read or understand English, but with scores of 46 and 45, they most certainly passed the exam. If the ninth, 10th dipole is a success in peripheries like Padapur, what does that say of the larger school system within which it emerges and is sustained? In the first instance, that efficacious as it was, it was more performative than performance. Nishit and Viren were aware of the difference. They knew they couldn't read English. But between the exam-focused rituals in 10th grade and the sacrifice of the 9th grade, the difference was rendered tolerable for students. In the second instance, the 9th, 10th dipole merely makes a virtue of necessity. The neglect-focused cycle of teacher time that sets up the dipole is nothing but a pragmatic response to scarce teacher time. Favorable PTR ratios obscure the fact that the average high school in Tamil Nadu has just about 10 teachers. Any teacher absence, therefore, for any reason, however momentary, whatever official work or illness, results in classrooms outnumbering available teachers. This situation is exacerbated by a chronic lack of support staff in an increasingly data-hungry school system seeking accountability. Whether new data demands or the expensive welfare role of the government's expansive welfare role of the government school, it is teachers who remain the last mile duty bearers. Finally, the ninth tenth dipole is an adjustment by teachers and students of two irreconcilable sets of logic: the no detention regime that emphasizes schooling for all, and the high stakes regime that sorts and labels teachers and students. In a poorly resourced school system, one where the state has repeatedly refused its commitment to invest 6% of GDP in public education, the dipole is simply the efficient deployment of scarce teacher time in the board exam classes, even if at the expense of other classrooms, and even if performative rather than performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. We are back. Jen is back with us. So, Jen, you have seven minutes to finalize the second part of your presentation. Please share Thank slides. Thank you, Julius. Um, I will just go to the results. Uh, yeah. Basically, all I wanted to show you from my specification is that we look out for the interaction effect here, the B3 coefficient. So I'll just keep it moving. Um, and that I satisfied all the key assumptions under this um, method. Um, my sample size for the study was 1,297 uh, students. And um, we have TAL students, uh, uh, the treated group and the comparison group, uh, the waitlisted TAL students who are yet to receive the program, who are receiving a business as usual study hour. Um, so for each cohort, there is a baseline measure before them for the TAL um, implementation and an endline measure. And I would, I would mention that I worked directly with um, the government's implementation model, which is um, run by the national service participants. So um, these participants are, of course, trained and supported um, by the youth impact team as well. Uh, so, yes, next um, so the main headline results here is that I find that, are we looking at the same thing? Yes. I find that teaching at the right level significantly reduces the mental health difficulties of children that are exposed to the pedagogy compared to children that are yet to be exposed to the pedagogy, um, specifically by 0.15 standard deviations um, at the 10% level. And I find um, 
more interestingly, that it increases the pro-sociality, um, pro-social behavior of the kids that are exposed to the, the intervention compared to the kids that are not yet exposed to the intervention. Specifically on anxiety and depression, I don't find any significant um, effect here, any meaningful effect, even though I can see it's moving in the right direction. And I'd like to note that I'm, I'm talking about screening for difficulties because I think you have to be careful a little bit with language in terms of researching mental health that I'm not talking about diagnostic measures. So I'm not diagnosing anyone with anxiety or depression, but rather being screened for symptoms of, of these challenges. Um, as expected, there are differential effects by baseline mental health difficulties. So those who had a higher level of um, whether total difficulties measured by the SDQ or anxiety and depressive um, difficulties had even greater benefits because of TAL. So they experienced a 0.5 standard deviation uh, in total difficulties. So a reduction in total difficulties compared to their non-TAL counterparts. Um, unfortunately, in this study, I find that there are null effects on my education success um, outcomes. So that's on test scores and attendance. And we can dig into this late, um, a little bit in our discussion. I didn't put my regression output here. Um, but on attendance, I will, I will say that, you know, I didn't have a full sample because I'm collecting admin data. And on education outcomes, um, on test scores, sorry, a limitation of the studies that I, I wasn't using the TAL assessment um, tool or the a type tool, um, but rather the admin data collected from the school, so the school-based test results. So it's, it's possible that this is a limitation, but also see it as an opportunity, um, because I think that as policymakers are making decisions based off their own data that they're collecting, which would be the school-based test results, it would it's possible that we can include um, the TAL assessment, as well as um, school admin data in future much larger studies than what I, I can show here. And also interestingly, the recent paper by Rachel Mega and uh, Noam Angris did show the variance that happens um, in, in a lot of these education interventions. Um, due to implementation challenges and, and delivery models. So I, I think I'm citing delivery models here as maybe having a lower effect than a direct delivery model because this was done through the national service participants. Okay. A few um, things that the, uh, the teachers and education officers said um, that I thought was quite interesting to highlight from the chief education officer in the region that I was working in said, you know, TAL reinforces key concepts and builds self-esteem and confidence. When they work in small groups, it helps them open up. You can hear their voices. Without that, you don't even know if they understand. And another teacher said, you know, the pupils seem to be open and free, they're confident and free spirited. All of this really supporting the findings that I have. Um, and another teacher saying even slow learners are freely participating in class. Some used to display bad behavior, but these days there's positive change. So to sum up, I think this uh, my main takeaways is that these results that I, I show are really in line with the growing literature demonstrating how education interventions can support the mental health and overall well-being of young people. Specifically, that student-centered pedagogies that are activity-based include peer learning, no corporal punishment, have been shown to um, improve psychosocial outcomes. And in TAL, what we have observed is that the ease with which students ask questions, the inclusion of structured play activities such as energizers, the use of small group peer activities to reinforce um, concepts, of course, no corporal punishments. All of these things are creating a positive school climate for students. So really what I wanted to highlight is that I, I, I believe that there are opportunities um, to leverage these ongoing uh, education interventions that we have in the space to think more broadly about how they affect students' mental health and overall well-being, how we can connect the two, because there, there really is a strong evidence base for the two connecting. And that this, um, I believe, also fills an important research gap, presenting one of the first studies linking teaching at the right level to mental health, but there are, there's so much more evidence that's needed to inform more context relevant policies. So with that, I will say thank you for your attendance. I apologize for the technology issues, but I hope I have been clear and you've been able to get where I'm going with the study. Thank you, Julius. Thank you. For a think tank, we are based in Nigeria. Um, our name is uh, Center for Study of Economics of Africa. 
And um, this work I'm about to present is actually a joint work uh, between the center and researchers from uh, RICE. Um, um, I mean, Julius, uh, Mitchell, Rusty, and my colleagues, um, Sistus um, is online, and um, we, we will be presenting this together. So um, we, I will be speaking about instructional alignment in Nigeria using survey of an Arctic uh, curriculum. And um, the, the, the key thing here is the fact that um, as education practitioners or academia that we are in this room, um, we will have heard about um, concepts around uh, in, uh, incoherence, about the misalignment, about the pace of curriculum in recent times or literature. And one of these points to the fact that uh, there is an issue that uh, I imagine out of that. However, um, sometimes this concept actually look like an abstract um, or theory that is far from reality. In this work using the uh, SEC tool, we are trying to actually uh, really concretize this, uh, what do we mean by misalignment and um, where do misalignment occur and um, what are the pace of the curriculum? And what does all of these, what, what do they mean for um, learning in, in, in the classrooms? So um, as a background, I mean, um, global literature suggests the fact that um, uh, disparity between standards, between uh, classroom instructions and assessment are quite common. And when this is present, we tend to actually see um, um, low learning outcomes. Um, and these are kind of the source of uh, misalignment in the system. So what I were trying to do is, where is this misalignment? Why is this uh, misalignment? And um, how do we begin to think about this misalignment? So um, we embark on this study, um, trying to answer these two questions. To evaluate uh, the extent of alignment across instructional components uh, in the primary school system in Nigeria, and also to investigate the curriculum pace across um, primary one to primary six uh, in, in Nigerian uh, education system. This is actually one area or one part of the objective that I think is quite in, uh, novel in, in, in this study because um, we, uh, this um, methodology has been applied more around um, trying to answer the question of uh, alignment, but not in the area of um, pace of the curriculum. So SEC methodology, uh, in, in one breath, you could look at it as um, uh, looking at four things and trying to see what is going on around those four things. So um, think of curriculum as a formal document that is produced by policymakers, right? By the time this policy document moves from policymakers into the classroom, we talked about enacted curriculum. Most times they are not the same anymore. And so to what, what are the differences in, in, in between the two? By the time this moves from teachers to students, we talked about um, land curriculum. Again, that might be really, really different. And also when we move from even what is assessed uh, uh, to, to the student and what is there as learned, it will also be different. But also we could talk about assessed uh, curriculum and the intended one, about the enacted one and in different ways. So there are quite a number of ways that misalignment uh, could take place in the system. So what we are trying to do with this SEC methodology is to uh, ask the question around especially what happened with the curriculum and the uh, assessment, what happened between the curriculum and, uh, and uh, classroom instructions. And the methodology as um, a combination of qualitative and quantitative approach, whereby um, you bring in a panel of experts, um, this panel of experts, um, they come from the curriculum body, assessment bodies, policy bodies, teachers, school administrators. And all of these people actually, they, they, they sit together in order to actually look at this document, uh, uh, I mean, the curriculum, uh, look at the uh, assessment tools. And all of them actually give a kind of what we call a ranking of the cognitive demand in each of these uh, 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 items. But more importantly, we also take these tools to the teachers in the classrooms. And when teachers also will be doing the same thing, such at the end of the day, we could see how it is uh, the, the thought process of the framework of the curriculum, the process, uh, uh, I mean, to also the people making the assessment, the teachers, and all of this in order to actually uh, uh, fit everything together to see what, what we are, uh, are they not speaking to one another. 
Yeah, so um, the study was conducted in Nigeria. Um, we focused on two subjects, English and mathematics. And uh, because we are talking about uh, basic education, uh, the, that role actually is being take, uh, uh, taken by uh, state government. And so we focus on two states, Oyo State and Jigawa State. One is in the southern part of the country, the other is in the northern part of the country. Overall, we uh, uh, looked at 100 public primary schools, and in each of these schools, we uh, uh, randomize and uh, select teachers that are uh, conversant in both um, uh, English and mathematics. Also, we, we, we also uh, randomize between people uh, teaching at the lower level and upper primary. Overall, 200 teachers actually were surveyed uh, for this work. Um, so in terms of the analysis, uh, we focused on um, two parts. One is within component alignment. And that speaks to the fact that um, um, the curriculum, what is the pace of the curriculum itself? The, I mean, from primary one to primary six. Uh, also, we look at the teacher's instruction. What is the progression and pace of that instruction uh, from primary one to primary six? But also, we look at the uh, 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 exam results. This is actually a national exam conducted in Nigeria. We collected three of these exams, and the data we have actually is at item level, such that we are not just looking at how many passed, but in what topic area are they actually uh, the success rate across uh, these uh, 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 items. Items. Also, we are going to be looking at um, across uh, component uh, alignment. We're looking at um, curriculum versus uh, exam alignment, uh, curriculum versus teacher instruction, and also the instruction versus exam alignment. So I will show you some results. Um, I believe most people will know how this should be interpreted, but this you're actually looking at a 3D graph. Uh, it has three dimensions. Here we have the topics, where we have the cognitive demand, and the color you see is actually showing depth in terms of the coverage of each of the two. So maybe when I'm interpreting this, you look at the intersection of this and this, and the color in, in, in that space to see the depth of that. For example, when you look at um, primary one to primary three, you could see that uh, uh, the emphasis is on number and numeration, and also to some extent measurement, and also basic uh, uh, operation. That's actually the three main topics that's uh, widely covered in the curriculum. But when you look at uh, the other axes, you find that the more cognitive demand uh, that is in the size in the curriculum is around memorize. Uh, pro, uh, procedure, performing procedure, and to less, lesser extent uh, to demonstrate the knowledge that has been picked up. Um, so by, but by the time we move to uh, upper primary, primary four to primary five, uh, six, sorry, you see that the emphasis still remains around numbers, basic operation, and also measurement, but some element of trigonometry and everyday statistics has emerged. Overall, when we combine all of this, you could see the fact that uh, these three topics accounted for 70% of what we have in the curriculum in terms of how the curriculum objectives were, uh, were highlighted. Now, what about the pace of the curriculum in this space? Again, in interpreting this, you can look at two aspects. I mean, the upper part actually, we, we call that the cross grain alignment measures. And here we have the fine grain alignment measures. This is just alignment across topics. So look at numbers. There are many things on that numbers, but when you look at number alone, that's the alignment you see. But when you look at the component other numbers, that's actually this fine, uh, fine grain alignment, and that's what you see. So expectedly, you, are, you, you will know that this actually will have lesser alignment compared to this. But I mean, uh, what is of importance in the result here is this. If you look at the level uh, of alignment, uh, when you move from primary, I mean, lower primary to upper primary, you find that, that I mean, uh, the level of alignment is quite high. I mean, this is 0. Uh, 0. 0.75. But as we move to the upper primary, a little it drops, which means at the lower primary, the pace of the curriculum is actually quite slow. And when you move to the higher level, the pace is a little bit higher. And the same thing when you even look at the fine grain in, in, in that area. So we can really see that curriculum, as we move from uh, one level to the other, it's actually quite uh, slow, which is actually an ideal system. What, you, what, you, what we like to see, or what the literature tends to say, OK, the curriculum should not be too fast. But when you look at um, 
what is taking place in, in, in the classroom in terms of uh, teachers' instruction. Uh, again, when you look at what is being covered, numbers. Five minutes. Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> numbers, basic operation. It's also actually uh, more advanced, but you could see that teachers, in, in a way, uh, uh, two topics really, really dominate in the classroom compared to uh, the three that we talked about in the curriculum. And same level of cognitive demand also domin uh, dominates in the class in terms of memorize and uh, procedures. So what about the uh, a kind of uh, pace of the curriculum in the classroom? We find that the totally pace even becomes slower in the upper primary compared to in the lower primary, which is actually what you don't expect. So teachers are actually not moving as fast as they should, or the curriculum is expected, expecting them to move. So you ask these two questions, why are teachers not moving? Is it that they don't have the con uh, 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 content expertise in order to actually uh, 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 go into those higher levels? Or, teach, or, or uh, students are also not picking up what they need to be picking up, so that it's forcing teachers to actually concentrate on lower, lower level, such that slowing down. To, so, but the, the curriculum Curriculum in this case is very slow. Uh, in terms of assessment, it also covers, but assessment is actually quite broader than what we see in both instruction and, uh, and, and curriculum in terms of its emphasis. This is actually more spread. In terms of performance, when we look at the performance in mathematics, you find that the performance is quite low. In no cases do we have uh, this, uh, I mean, performance level uh, exceeding 50%. But what is actually quite uh, uh, curious is the fact that uh, when you see areas where students are performing a lot or much better, you find that it's actually area that is less covered cover in the classrooms. And I think one reason for that is because it's less covered, one of the, when you look at the assessment around that level, it's mostly around memorization. So students are actually about to pass. But even when, uh, for concept that is covered in the classrooms, even when you move from memorization to procedure or to demonstrate, even little movement in cognitive demand, failure rate actually spikes up, even though it's actually uh, being covered in the classroom. So that points to one uh, uh, part of the story we, we are seeing here is the fact that uh, the cognitive demand also, I mean, in terms of where you concentrate on, uh, also uh, matters in terms of the student being able to even effectively respond when it comes to exam conditions uh, that they will face, which is not going to in, a, in any way be similar to what uh, they have in the classrooms. I have less than three minutes, so I don't want to really go too much into the literacy. The result I would say for the literacy is actually quite similar to what we see in the numeracy. In fact, the curriculum is slower in, in, in that area, and more importantly, Importantly, uh, we see some of the findings in terms of shallowness of um, uh, what you see in the exam compares to teachers' instruction. So let me just go into the um, to alignment issues that um, uh, emerge out of uh, these studies. Number one is that the pace of the curriculum is slow. And that raises the question around what is going on. Is it the teacher's uh, uh, competencies that is slowing it or the, uh, uh, or the student grasp of the knowledge? Also, uh, in terms of cognitive demand, concentration has tend to be on the procedure knowledge and less on the conceptual understanding. And instructions and examination has uh, one of the lowest level of alignment. Uh, performance level is in, in lower uh, uh, topics less covered uh, in the curriculum and instructions have a quite higher uh, number of uh, uh, achievements the, in terms of success rate. And one explanation, I mean, that we could point out in, in our analysis is the fact that level of cognitive demand in the assessment really, really explains this divergence. So part of how we are trying to summarize or make sense of all of this is the fact that um, uh, this is pointing to the fact that alignment matters, but the dimension at which that alignment takes place matters even much more. What we are saying here is what you can see in this matrix is look at the standard and instruction and assessment. And when, uh, when you talk about alignment between the two, if it is towards uh, lower cognitive demand, you still don't see learning, take, uh, learning will not take place in the classrooms. You have to actually see that trans, I mean, that kind of alignment uh, converging towards this higher level of cognitive demand for us to actually see concrete learning taking place in our classrooms. Okay, thank you. It's even 20 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so we'll take, we'll follow the same procedure as earlier on. 
take the three questions and then we'll also get an opportunity to get questions from online. Yes, we'll begin with Matthew. Maybe anybody this side? Another hand? Okay, we'll take this. Okay, please. Hi, I'm Matthew Dukes at RTI. My question is for Jennifer. Um, I loved both halves of your presentation. Um, and really fantastic, much needed data on mental health in schools in Africa. Um, on the outcomes, I, I feel like when you're using a self-rated scale to measure a, an intervention in a new context, you have to do a little bit of work to convince us that you've measured a generalized shift in um, pro-sociality, for example. Um, which is tough to do, but one one question, specific question I could ask is, do you have um, some information about the specific items that that uh, were impacted? Like, for example, there's an item in the SDQ which is, I finished work successfully or something like that, which you know you could see mapping very closely onto TAL, um, and others like I worry a lot, which are a bit more generalized. So I'd love to know a bit more about that, and also your negative coefficients on pro-sociality, which I didn't understand. I'd like you to explain that if you can. There's a positive and two negative. Okay. Thank you. Over right here, Debbie. Thank you. Hi, my question is also for Jennifer. Um, <laughs> echoing um, Matthew's praise as well. I'm curious whether you saw any heterogeneity in terms of mental health outcomes among students for whom Tara worked really well um, and those who tended to struggle more, um, if you were able to disaggregate by that. And your neighbor? Yeah, my, my question is also for Jennifer. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So just extending from what Debbie was saying, so my questions are related to one gender, second is learning disability. So just wondering, like, have you run any moderation analysis to see whether teaching at right level would, for example, like work better for like children with dys uh, dyslexia or dyscalculia, which would be even more amazing because these children tend to like, struggle a lot with uh, you know, mental health in an academic learning environment. Okay, we'll take other questions. Please don't ask Jane questions. Yeah. Let's ask the panelists here. So we have Bella over there. Oh, you got up coming the other way. Do I have someone this side? Yes, there's a hand there. So I'm going to be then. sneaky. One to Miriam, um, and then a small one to. Uh, <laughs> not saying. So Miriam, uh, I think I, I was just fascinated. I just super loved your work, but I was just wondering. If you also considered um, the, you know, out of classroom, out of school learning, things were happening in in ninth. I mean, I uh, in 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 grade nine. Uh, so I wonder if there were any measures at all to look at how students were dead spending time, whether doing kabaddi or other things. But surely something was happening. Did that lead to their something from the non-academic space? Uh, and then finally cramming it all in in grade 10. That's a question to you, whether you at all considered that. And one tiny question is there, that, and back to Tal, is that there has been an issue that the way we've been looking at measurement of Tal, it's about literacy and numeracy, but not social emotional learning. And, you know, here is a space that is, uh, we still sort of groping with measures for social emotional learning in the way, uh, the Global Coalition for Accelerated Learning for Foundation Learning is coming together. How do you look at that end of the definition of um, foundation learning, literacy, numeracy, and plus? Thank you. Okay. okay. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen from South Africa. Uh, my question is for Miko. Um, can you tell me a bit more about how you estimated your treatment intensity effect? Uh, I know I've always struggled to to kind of measure the effect of the treated on where on where treatment was implemented with more fidelity. It's kind of like something we obviously want to do. So I'm interested to hear how did you actually estimate that? Thanks. Thank you. Anybody has a question for Deji? The last paper. Yes. I think I can go. Okay. People online will hear you unless you have the mic. That's fine. It's for our online audience. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, no, Deji, I think uh, I can't remember, uh, but Lant was presenting a similar paper, or maybe it was from the same uh, context as yours. But, uh, you know, 
I know uh, fairly understand the incoherences you found broadly in terms of you know uh, the curriculum and then teaching practices and ultimately what is being assessed. But just thoughts on you know what what sort of policy recommendations could come in as a in any country you know most of uh, many countries would go through either a first a curriculum revision right everything else will follow so what what are you telling the people who are potentially or countries or contexts who are potentially either starting to do a curriculum or starting to let's say uh, particularly for many other countries starting to enact the curriculum in the classrooms any 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 thoughts on that I know you rushed so probably giving you that chance to talk about it in detail. Great, so we'll answer those and then after that we'll also pick questions from online. Okay, Jen, are you there? Yes, Julius. I hope I cover all the questions, but if I miss anyone, you can always follow up. So the first question was Matthew from RTI, I believe, and he spoke about um, doing some convincing on the skills. And I, I absolutely agree. Of course, these are self-report skills. And um, there is always that question of how much do we believe this? Um, but this is a standard in the field in terms of how we how we measure some of these mental health outcomes that we care about. Um, I, I did try and interrogate it a little bit, having the teachers also report on their observations of the students. I didn't actually see any differential effects there between those who were exposed to tell and those who were not exposed to tell. And then in terms of the sub skills, you had said something about a decrease in pro-sociality that you wanted to understand. What I was showing was rather a significant increase in pro-sociality. So the sub constructs in um, the SDQ, pro-sociality is one of them. And the way that the outcome is constructed is that total difficulties includes all of these externalizing and internalizing subskills, excluding pro-sociality because it moves in the opposite direction. So all of the subskills like inattention, emotion problems, peer problems are all grouped together called total difficulties and then pro-sociality stands alone. So are you asking like if I could see mapping onto some of the questions that specifically map onto Tal, I was careful not to deconstruct the subskills too much um, because I thought it would raise more questions like your first question around like how much can we trust these skills so I wanted it to be a more robust skill because it is designed to really um, holistically capture all of these things that are going on um, and then the second question I think was from Debbie if I got your name correctly and was on heterogeneity for those who tell work specifically well this is a really good um, question, and I, I have to say I haven't interrogated this with my study sample because I, I took it from the hypothesis that in improving the school climate for students, we would find an overall increase in mental health um, for the, the students that were exposed to Tau. So it was less about looking at it from the education side because there's such a robust literature already on the education outcomes. So even though I found null effects, it wasn't such a concern because my main um, objective was to really show what else could be done with, with TAL to leverage this ongoing um, intervention already. And, and just to give some context that uh, prior to my doctoral research, um, I worked with Youth Impact as their TAL program manager and their research manager. So I was seeing this in action. I, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that I was collecting um, that I really wanted to investigate and test further. So that's really the impetus for the study. Um, Julius, should I answer the last question? Do you, yeah, do you want to tie that to the social emotional learning issues? What's that? The, the, that, was, that was Baylor's question, isn't it? Yes, I think so. But I didn't quite get what the question was for social emotional learning. It's measures. 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 Oh, yes. So I wasn't testing social emotional learning or life skills. I wasn't quite testing for that. But yes, there is such an opportunity for that. Um, but this study was specifically testing for specific mental health difficulties. Um, but yeah, I think this is an ongoing co conversation and should be incorporated in all of our assessments of TAL because there's obviously a clear mapping onto SEL. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. We'll come into here and uh, Miriam. I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but it's you, you seem to want to know uh, what else ninth grade students are doing out of class. Out of class, uh, I, I I I don't know what to say in response, but uh, some, the, the subtext seems to be that Kabaddi and Katai was not was somehow nothing, and I want to sort of push back and say no, 
for the students in the class. Uh, I mean, these are not sort of, you know, dopes. They enjoyed it. This meant a lot to them doing the Kabaddi and the Kadai, especially after a year of COVID. And, you know, these are contexts, rural contexts, where often there are no commons outside the school. So for them to not have been in a common space, but sort of isolated into their own homes, for them to have this chance uh, was brilliant. But the larger point also is that this was enabled by a sort of larger system failure about not having teachers, a larger systemic failure about not actually responding uh, in any real way to COVID outside the learning loss narrative, as if that was the only thing that happened during COVID. Uh, so yes, uh, I just want to underline Kabardi and Kadai was very important, and that made sense for students where they were. Okay, Micho, intensity. Yeah, thanks for your question. So the way we calculated just the mechanics of it is look at the number of cycles that were implemented in a school, and then they get assigned a percent. So if you implemented three cycles out of five, that becomes 60%, so 0 0.6. So all the schools get on the scale of zero to one in terms of treatment intensity, and then an IV regression where that's instrumented with the random assignment. But uh, also something that I'll just mention quickly uh, to add some context as well, is that we had two assumptions that we list in the paper for this to work, where you have to assume that treatment effects scale linearly with program implementation. And then also that uh, in the control group schools, that potential treatment effects are uncorrelated with weeks of implementation of the program. So we think these are reasonable assumptions for this context that students likely benefited from more weeks of instruction. And then also thinking about that, that it was the qualitative evidence from the process evaluation that really cemented it for us that they just implemented weeks of the program because they were confused about their treatment assignments. So having that qualitative evidence helped us make that assumption. But if you think about using this, it's good to think about those as well. Okay, Deji. Okay, so thanks. Um, in terms of what should policymakers be thinking about, um, I will not be strong in saying this is what you should do. I would rather be saying this is what you should be thinking more around, and I think that is around the classrooms. If you look at the um, alignment issues that were raised, um, I think most of them tends to concentrate within the classroom in terms of uh, slower pace, um, uh, misalignment of uh, the, uh, the, the instruction and, and the exams, and even uh, the cognitive demand uh, within the classroom. So it just points to the fact that there's a lot going in the classroom that we don't understand and we need to unravel. And we used to, uh, I mean, we need to use that as a basis for any intervention we are designing. Okay, we'll take another round of questions. Still have 12 minutes. Yes, there's one hand. There is one hand over here. Where's the first? Sorry, I missed the first. Where's the first one? And there is there's a hand there. So you could begin with Amanda. Yeah, begin from where you are. Yes, begin with that. Behind you. Hi, my question's for Jennifer. Is that okay, Julius? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so this question is a little bit about dose and also who's delivering the program. All right, so as I understand it, these children are getting you know, a one hour TARL class and that's being delivered by TSPs or um, basically teacher aides, let's say. And, and these teacher aides are, and so as I understand it, the teachers in the school are not being trained in TARL and they're not delivering TARL, it's just the TSPs. Is that right? No, okay. So my question is, um, I'll, I'm trying to get it spill over here because it seems like you're having a big effect from a one hour kind of intervention. And I'm wondering if other teachers in the school are also being exposed to TARL, maybe these TARL methodologies are kind of spilling over into their other non-TARL classes, right? If you're training teachers on this methodology on kind of how to interact with children and the children are, are really responding to it, I'm wondering if they're using methods in their other class, right? So ultimately my question is, are, you know, if you had any interviews with, with teachers, are you seeing that they're using these TARL type methods in throughout the school day and not just this one TARL hour? Okay, over here. Sorry. 
My question is to Miriam. It seems like these high stakes tests in grade 10 had a real big effort, uh, impact on the effort of teachers and, and students, and they didn't do anything in grade nine. Now, I would think it's much more efficient to actually spare your effort over grade nine and grade 10, and you can do with less work in total, you can actually have higher exam results. But apparently teachers and students don't think that way. Do you know how they were thinking? Okay. Over here. Hi, um, uh, my name is Arvind. I work for Education Initiatives in India. Uh, my question is for Miriam. Uh, first of all, uh, um, a great paper, and I loved your storytelling skills. So, um, uh, my question was with regards to uh, initially when you mentioned that uh, the school was uh, um, situated in a marginalized context uh, for, uh, within the community as well. Um, uh, the experiences that you saw, the sort of the shape of the classroom, so to speak. Uh, 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 the good, the bad, or the whatever, or was that uh, um, uh, only the result of uh, um, like a systemic uh, uh, or a policy-based uh, uh, sort of failure, or did the marginalized context also have to do with it, or was it like an intersectionality between both of them? So just the question was, how did the marginal context sort of come into play uh, in the construction of that classroom? Okay. Did I, I think I saw some hand. Hi, uh, Rajesh Singh, PAL Network. Wow. A quick question to the gentleman from ID Insight. Uh, sometimes TAL almost feels like it's either a complementary or parallel track to uh, education. So how difficult is it to actually scale it up? You know, when you're thinking about scaling it up and maintaining the results in a new geography. Thank you. Okay, so let's answer those. Uh, Jen, do you want to go first again? Yes. Um, so in answering my question, I would like to caveat that there are current youth impact people in the room, so they can speak specifically on the ongoing delivery models. But I believe youth impact is in eight out of 10 education regions now and explore various delivery models. But in the study sample that I have, I use um, the national service participants. So those are the ones that are delivering um, the intervention. Not to say that teachers are not delivering the intervention, but that in my study sample, I'm working with the national service participants. So just to provide that clarification. And then um, you ask a really, really good question on how this is mapping onto what's happening in the rest of the hours outside of TAL. I think this is an ongoing conversation, um, thinking about how are the principles of teaching at the right level, how is the pedagogy being inculcated or um, applied to the, the, the various subjects. And there are a few things that I can speak anecdotally about because um, I didn't do the research specifically on this, but just to give you a, a sense of, uh, of my take on it is that there is um, a applied principle and form in that teachers who've observed TAL and teachers who've been trained in TAL are inspired to try things like using smaller groups to do activities, using multiple problems for differentiated um, classrooms and teaching. So some of, some of the, the methods used in TAL are being applied, not to say that they're doing TAL specifically, but they're applying the principles. Now, what also is being observed is that I think what clearly we can see in TAL is that we're expanding the, the toolkits that teachers have. So it's not, it's not so um, like, it, it, it's, it's a, I don't wanna say back to basics, but it, it's just that teachers who've been taught in a certain way are being reminded of their pedagogy that they used to use and are being given additional tools on how to teach certain things that they've been they've been stuck teaching in one simple way and they're getting other ways of teaching it as well so what teachers are also asking for is like can you give us additional tools to teach these other more complicated concepts so the, i think there is a, a, a research gap there and more that can be done beyond the foundational literacy and numeracy so there's an opportunity thank you miriam the question on high stakes tests Yes, so the high stakes tests are distorting clearly the system and uh, while I appreciate your question of how are teachers and students thinking about it and sort of assuming that uh, having that spread over two years would be sort of more efficient. Uh, 
Well, A, that choice isn't available because uh, the exam is in grade 10 and you are uh, the, the demands on teacher time are not sort of amortized in quite the same way. So it, the system demands a lot of data. And when you are and given this high stakes test at the end of uh, high school, I mean, as a teacher, it's far more sensible to make your students work in that one year than somehow find a way or even imagine that you have the control to figure out how your instruction time is going to be spread across the year. So I, I, I actually don't think it's possible. And it's not because they aren't thinking. They're in fact being exceptionally smart about both human psychology and the fact that, you know, if you have to make an effort, you have to get them at one time all together, feed everything in and get them over that exam, because that becomes the focus. And uh, what's sad is that we don't have adequate teachers. I mean, clearly, these are teachers willing to work. You know, some of the larger narratives that seem to underlie questions about how student, how teachers think seem to be that somehow they think uh, in ways that are self-interested. But here are teachers sort of willing to spend their Saturdays and Sundays working with these students when, you know, they aren't getting paid extra for it, but simply because they recognize that this, this certificate is important because that that constitutes the end of sort of basic schooling in India. And, and that kind of that incentive to get that certificate also then shapes how students think. If you are going to make an effort, you'd rather make an almighty effort in that one year than try and spread out your effort in some sensible way, because, well, we're not machines in quite the same way. I think that's what I'd say. Uh, Rachel? Yes, absolutely. So thank oh, you. You had a question about sort of the marginalized context. So absolutely. I mean, the marginalized context is part of the systemic uh, structural issue and, and, and the social marginalization sort of is, uh, is, is translating and reflecting in the educational marginalization. You know pro as, as well as I do that today, anyone with money in India isn't going to a government school. So there are already these structural uh, disadvantages, which are then translating into educational disadvantages, because schools are under-resourced, and the more rural and more peripheral it is, the, the under-resourcing is, is higher. We also know that systemically we do not have enough high schools in rural areas. They're far more of an urban phenomenon. So clearly all of that is just compounding what's happening in the school. Okay, Nichon? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for your question. Uh, it's definitely a challenging one to answer. To give to say that I know the answer would be hubris, um, but I'll give some of my early thoughts just on, on this in terms of um, how does this scale in, in different geographies. Um, some of the learnings from this work um, highlights the need for having enough teacher capacity to do this. And uh, as we highlighted, sort of giving teachers enough training to implement it. And I think those will likely be some cost drivers, the cost of training teachers and, and making sure that it's a sustainable, that's why we wanted to do the cost effectiveness analysis so that is it appropriate for this context, but also just in terms of uh, doing this in different geographies. Um, our team is going to work on a couple of different tall based programs and I'd be interested to speak to them and perhaps I can share those learnings with you, but something that I think is necessary is having enough within school variation within grade variation in skills so that you can actually group them. Uh, we were concerned that if children are starting off from very low levels can you actually group them into different reading levels? So I think in new geographies, just making sure you have that variation in student skills in a classroom so that you can implement TARL is something to consider. Okay, I'll ask Deji a question since we didn't get a second round. So Deji, I think we saw that uh, almost all the components that you have in the study show uh, emphasis on the lower cognitive domains. And so in line with uh, the question on policy, uh, implications. What would you have to say about that on the issue of overemphasis on the lower level cognitive domain? Okay, so thank you. Um, I think 
even though I mean, why why the concentration on this lower cognitive uh, uh, demand was not part of this very study? And I think um, when we begin to analyze this study, we find that it's actually a major issue. And I think we did a subsequent survey in these two states. And what we asked in those surveys were around um, what happened, what are the classroom practices in terms of um, how do you, um, how do, you uh, do some uh, the tests, what are the influence of um, examinations on the classroom, also on what are the kind of um, training around cognitive demand. And about 40% actually has not actually had training, um, even though they passed through teacher training college, they don't actually recall what it, what's, or what even procedure, how is it different from even cognitive. So those kind of very basic concepts that can enable them to translate those different, uh, 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 what, what, what we think as uh, very important in terms of uh, cognitive uh, knowledge, it's not actually present. So for that reason, it's still kind of the belief that this is actually how it has been done. And, and I mean, knowing the, 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 uh, between right or wrong, I mean, that kind of um, understanding is still lacking. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's, it's something that is painting a clear picture around the need for capacity around that area. I mean, like I said, we need to actually understand better what is going on in classrooms and what are teachers in terms of even um, the, the, the extent to which they are emphasizing these different concepts and why are they actually putting emphasis on this more than that? Given that, I mean, conceptually, uh, you, you expect that it is this conceptual understanding that is the key. So why are they actually not reaching that level? Is it the problem with the teachers or the problem with the system? I think it's something we need to actually shed more light on. Okay, thank you. So I'll just wrap it up with three main takeaways for me. Targeted instruction programs are important for children's learning, but also for their overall well-being. Uh, the teachers, uh, the case of India that we've heard Miriam talk about, they're adjusting to the realities of the system in which they are operating. And we see this dipole system, which is very confusing and really not the best. You spend a whole year playing and not learning, and then you push to your limits in the final year just because of the exam. But this is how the system is designed. And then finally, both procedural and conceptual competencies are quite important for children to learn because we see that overemphasis on lower levels of cognitive demand actually led to low performance. So thank you so much. Let's thank our panel.